Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 12th of September and joining me on this edition are assistant editor Steve Withers. Mark is a prematurely middle-aged prick. News, news editor Mark Hodgkinson. It's fair to um, <laughs> I've lost my thread now. <laughs> if you have to travel alone, travel in style. And our special guest is Mark Botwright. I don't think you're an idiot at all. Uh, welcome to the AV Forums podcast for this week. Uh, lots to get through there. There is tons of news. Um, obviously, we've still got some stuff to get uh, talking about from IFA, uh, which was now nearly two weeks ago. <laughs> Doesn't time fly? Uh, we've also got some big news from Sony and so on. But before we go to that news, and there was some little phone launched as well this week uh, at the time that we were recording the podcast. Uh, before that, uh, competitions. So uh, tell us what we can win, Mr. Borright. Okie dokes. Um, once again, we've got the, I'll, I'll try a different pronunciation, the Stelgis Audio Mega Giveaway. Uh, that's open to all members until September the 30th. Uh, third prize, some NS1 active speakers with Bluetooth. And these come in a uh, choice of seven colors. Second prize, the NS3 active speakers with Bluetooth. And first prize is the ML30 HD amplifier. And there's also the AK Racing Gaming Chair in a separate competition, and that's also open to all members until 30th of September. Do these gaming chairs, do they just work with, a, with a, you know, car racing and that kind of thing, or can you use them for other games? No, no, no. It, it, it's really just a kind of comfortable, supportive chair for gaming. If anyone kind of... <laughs> it, it, it sounds it's really stupid. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it does sound... I know it, it sounds kind of stupid, like, uh, you know, it, it's a, a kind of pointless thing, but... When you are gaming, if you find yourself particularly kind of tense or something like that, you do find yourself hunched in strange positions in a regular armchair. And something with a, a bit of support, something that's very comfortable, is, you know, worth its weight in gold. You're not going to put it in the lounge, though, are you? No, pr- probably not. <laughs> there probably you go, not. Granny. You can sit like in that chair. <laughs> I've entered this, actually, because I'm suffering with bad posture from sitting in a dining <laughs> chair for the last five years from my work. So, yeah, not allowed to enter Yeah. <laughs> Why um, not? I'm not an employee. I suppose that's true. Yeah. He's it, not, let me, it, it let me enter. So, you he's, know. A, he's a number, Steve. That's all he is. I'm just a number. <laughs> Although, uh, if you do win, back. questions will be raised. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you better hope you don't win. <laughs> Speak to my physiotherapist. <laughs> uh, any previous competition winners? None. Okay, uh, right, so let's move on. We've got lots to talk about, like I said, uh, this week. Hardware news, so rounding up IFA. Uh, the two things that we didn't discuss on last week's uh, IFA special, Steve, um, and that's the return of two well-known brands. However, they have been bought by third parties, and uh, we've yet to see what the product's going to be like, and we're talking about Sharp and Toshiba here. Yeah, Japanese brands seem to be like buses at the moment. You know, nothing for ages, and along come two at the same time. So the, I think the UMC Sharp deal was actually announced prior to IFA. But um, they had their, had a, a combined stand at the show, which I think is the first time they've done that. Uh, UMC, I, I've got to be honest here, isn't a company, a manufacturer that I was familiar with. Well, you see, I, th- I think they're from the future because if you look at the logo yeah. and you, if you turn the U on its side to make it a D, then it's from the future. <laughs> it's the same, um, same typeface as well. <laughs> it is identical, isn't it? Uh, Universal Media Corporation. They actually, um, depending on how you class Turkey, uh, if you don't think Turkey's part of Europe, uh, I guess most people don't consider it part of Europe at the moment, but that's where Vestal's based. Uh, then UMC are actually the largest manufacturer of TVs in Europe, and they're based in Slovakia. And they've bought the uh, the rights to the Sharp name for the European market. So in much the same way that Hisense have bought the rights to the Sharp name uh, in the Americas, uh, and also their production facilities, I think, in Mexico, in the same way Slovakia have bought um, Sharp's production facilities in Europe and also the rights to the name uh, in this in this part of the world. And the idea is that they're going to use um, not just the Sharp name, but also a lot of the Sharp tech as well. So things like the IGZO screen technology that Sharp have developed, which is actually quite interesting because what's really interesting about this screen technology is you can you can basically cut it into just about any shape you like. And so it's proving massively popular in the automotive industry where, where screens are becoming the norm in cars now. And because you can make them into different shapes, you can easily fit them into dashboards. So that's very popular. But from the TV perspective, they're also going to be launching a range of um, Sharp TVs in, 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 uh, in Europe that will combine uh, UMC's production facilities in this part of the world, plus uh, some of Sharp's technology. So it should be very interesting. I mean, we'll, hopefully what we'll see are, are some, um, you know, well-designed but relatively inexpensive televisions coming to the European market. I mean, Phil, you know as well as I do that for years we used to go to CES and steal these great Sharp TVs that never, ever got released in Europe. Yeah, so if um, UMC to... can actually bring some of that tech to the European market, I think that's a good thing. 
Toshiba started to do that as well towards the end. Um, I remember they, they flew me and, and quite a number of uh, UK journalists all the way out to Rome. Um, well, it was actually it, it was a bit like an easy jet flight. We didn't actually get to Rome, <laughs> if you know what <laughs> I mean. Um, but we did go to where they, they, they shoot a lot of the Roman stuff. I forget the name of the, the studio. Tar- That's the one. Studios. Yeah, we went to that studio and we walked down the Roman street and all the rest of it. Uh, and at that event, they announced their flagship TV, and, and obviously I videoed it all and interviewed the guy and all the rest. Of it. And at the end of the interview, he said, "Oh, by the way, this is not coming to the UK." <laughs> <laughs> I remember that very much. Is that Z? Yeah. Z2? Yeah, it was a Z2. Yeah, uh, Z2. It, a fantastic TV, but uh, no, it's not coming to the UK because we don't think we'll sell any. <laughs> Depressing, all right. isn't it, that happens. So, so you've flown us all the way out here to, to look at what exactly? Um, I think we've already got a fair idea of what we're what we're going to get from uh, Vestal and Toshiba because they've been making Vestal been making Toshiba TVs for a number of years. I noticed probably about three or four years ago that yeah. the menu systems and and the way they operated was between yeah. the two brands was just the same at the lower end anyway. So yeah. I don't think it's going to see. Any, well, I don't think we'll see any of the high end tech from Toshiba. I mean, I'm hopeful we will, but I've just got a feeling we won't. Well, I, the, there is that. I mean, uh, you just have to look at the market at the minute. It's a fight to the bottom, like it is in the yeah. US. I mean, you got the US. Uh, like we said last week or the week before, you know, we've walked into big brand US stores like Best Buy and Fry's, and, you know, you struggle to find any Japanese brands, to be honest. Um, the only one on that exception when we went to look was Sony. Um, there was no other Japanese brands no, within sight. So it just shows you which way the market goes. The other thing is that um, Vestal, they've got a name for making cheap rubbish but actually they can make some decent tvs um mark yeah 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 the, the, you know the, the perfectly serviceable tellies that what what they do lack as far as av forums you know readers and members are concerned is decent calibration control so they could be better that, and that's that's something i'm hoping they, they can get the 10 point white balance controls or even the two point white balance controls from the toshiba tvs in there and make them a whole lot better because the basic performance is okay and you know they often have good screen uniformity and all the rest of it and decent smart features so if they can just get more accuracy into the images then yeah then the, the, it could make a big improvement and like you say steve i mean the sharp stuff some of the sharp stuff that we've seen at ces has been absolutely brilliant and you think well, that's that's going to do so well when it comes to the uk and then it never did it never did never turned up yeah i know and it's always disappointing wasn't it we'd see these really really good looking tvs and then never ever saw them in the uk so i'm really hoping that the umc's deal with sharp will mean that we'll start to see some of that tech appearing in the european market and the same with um i guess with vestal it, it kind of makes sense isn't it? because although they're a huge manufacturer of tvs and you know, they tend to be behind the scenes um and vestal itself is not a name that's recognized that well in the uk uh, and the rest of you. It's no not matter. a brand in itself. No, is it, really? exactly. So buying to, the rights to the Shiba name um, really makes sense, doesn't it? Because that's a very, very recognisable name that people immediately associate with televisions. Uh, and I think that would probably uh, work quite well for Vestal. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's as you say, Mark, it depends on, you know, if, it, if they can bring some of the te- Toshiba tech into their into their TVs and things like calibration controls, then, then um, that, that could, I think it could be good news all around. Yeah. So Vestal behind Bush and Hitachi and all those Argos yes. brands that you see, basically. So uh, Finlux as well, isn't it? Finlux, of course, yeah. Actually, They're don't they make some TVs for some of the big names as well that are just sort of... Well, Pan- Panasonic, um, <laughs> a lot of the Panasonic um, yeah. really low-end stuff was made by them, but um, Panasonic are going back to doing their own low-end stuff. Uh, I think it didn't have a... The, 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 I think people found out it was, Ve- it was Vestal and then people uh, didn't want to buy it because they thought they were yeah. buying a Panasonic. Well, Panasonic's built its reputation on quality and, and uh, you know, if you're starting to do that, I think it, you know, it diminishes the brand, um, you know, the, the, the value of the brand. So yeah. I can see why they wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. Okay, so there was, um, there was a little phone launched um, <laughs> th- this week. We're recording this at 10 a.m. on Friday morning and already the, the pre-orders opened at one minute past eight this morning and the jet black version of the iPhone 7 has sold out already. It's gone. You can't get one now. They don't have to know how to make people spend a hell of a lot of money on tech. It hasn't really moved very far. <laughs> well, you know, Apple is um, it's not just a tech company. It's an aspirational product, a fashion statement. It's it's so many things. And, and, and yeah, you're right. The, the fan base will buy pretty much anything they put out. But I've got to say... That jet black phone did look really cool. Oh, give over. Uh, oh, give so over. You, you, 
Jeez. And I quite fancy a watch now as well for some reason. Oh, even though I've been doing it after all you said. <laughs> and those AirPod, you know, the AirPod uh, earphones. They just look. They, they, they weird. just look like weird. Growth. They just. But I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you come onto this with a headphone socket because this seems to be the the big thing. You know, the 3.5 mil jack has now disappeared and it's now part of the lightning. Um, well done, Apple. I know every headphone company on the planet is now clapping their hands and rubbing yeah. their hands a big glee because you've just created a whole new marketplace for them in terms of wireless uh, compatible iPhone 7 headphones. And if we've learned anything from Apple products from the iPad to the iPhone and so on is that the accessories that go with these products make these companies shed loads of money. And these markets spring up in no time, so you have just created a new market for wireless headphones that are iPhone 7 compatible. You can just see all the headphone companies out there rubbing their hands with glee. Or oh, you yeah. can see it. You know, if you look in our inbox at News mm-hmm. AB forums, we can already feel the effects. Probably a minute after the launch. A tsunami of new headphones mm-hmm. are coming in our direction. Yeah, I mean, they're clever. They, they said they were, what was the phrase that they used? They were um, Courage. They were, they, they were using courage. a bit of courage. No, they were just thinking, well, there's a niche. Let's do this and let's create another niche for ourselves because, you know, the whole success of the iPod wasn't just the product, uh, Mr. Portwright, but it was also the white earphones. They became a fashion statement. Yes, it's it's kind of it's strange to think of a time when just kind of dowdy black earphones were in. Um, it it's just it's such a simple thing, and that's that's continually what Apple does with branding, though, isn't it? It takes something ridiculously simple like a change of color and somehow turns it into this kind of aspirational statement of intent of kind of upwards mobility and the like it, it's it's very very strange very cult like um but you know it continues to show that it, it works in the long run and you know you wouldn't be surprised to see if, if this does the same for earphones we've got not to forget that they've got their own optional earphones but they're ready at 159 quid haven't they so that'll be an extra bit of uh, bit of money on the bottom line for them the little case that charges them sounds quite cool yeah Oh, they only, only got five hours charge as well. Though. Phone comes with a pair of earphones with a lightning connector and a lightning connector to um, 3.5 millimeter audio jack. Yeah, but how, how so. are you supposed to listen to your music while charging your phone? Yeah, uh, yeah there is that, I suppose. Although well, it's long battery life now. I mean, it, 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 it is an evolution rather than a revolution in terms of the phone, but uh, yeah, it looks cool uh, and they've crammed as much tech as they possibly can into it. So. Yeah, and I'm sure it will sell like a cure for cancer. I mean, that, they sold a billion phones, haven't they? <laughs> they said a billion. So, um, and and the, even the watch, which you know, I never thought as a particularly successful product, is the second largest selling watch in the world after Rolex. So, um, yeah, I think Apple are doing okay. Yeah, yeah, but is is that still such a big market though for for watches? Because everybody now has a mobile phone in their pocket, which they just look at for the time. So, and then they also said it was sales in terms of uh, revenue, not actually numbers. Yeah, so obviously, right. Because you know, Rolex are high, you know, high value items as well. So they're obviously looking at how much they're making per f- a watch sold. But uh, yeah, I mean, Apple's Apple, isn't it? Their, their products look. Cool. Yeah, they've got their claws into you, haven't they? <laughs> No, come on, Phil, even you'll admit, I mean, as Apple users ourselves, one thing I'll say about Apple is the products look cool. They are expensive. There's no question about that. You look at the prices of these phones, it's hellishly expensive. And they seem to be using a one-to-one ratio in terms of dollar to pound now. Um, so thank you, Brett, well, voted to leave. Well, no, you see, this, this is, I think this is another example of companies taking advantage of Brexit. Take advantage of it, yeah. uh, and, and be, you know, deliberately up in the price. Although the prices aren't that different from last year. I mean, like I say, they work. They work really well. Um, they look very cool. Yes, they are expensive. But uh, if you're a fan of Apple products, then you're going to be happy. Basically. And if you're well, not a fan, you're probably going to buy them anyway. Well, are you going to be happy? Because actually I'm looking at a lot of the comments that have been left on the forum and a lot of negativity there, mainly over the price. We haven't yet seen all the deals that are going to come out and they will appear on our price comparison thing uh, widget, which you can find on the website. There's That's a just lot part of the cycle, though, isn't it, with an Apple see, product I'm, launching, I'm, which is people get excited, people see the price and start complaining, and then people think, oh, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll stick in a pre-order anyway, because if, <laughs> if they sell out, then I'll be able to sell it on to someone anyway for what I paid for it, and I'll get to play with it anyway. You know, it, it's all yeah. part of this cycle. Well, now. I mean, the, the other thing is that I, I've got an iPhone 6 here, and I see nothing apart from the camera on the Plus, and I'm not paying... <laughs> an extra 400 quid to upgrade for because I'd only get 400 quid for the for the iPhone 6 in a trade-in so I'd have to pay another 400 quid to get the that and that's just the lower model um plus with the fancy camera 
and that that'd be the only reason I would upgrade is the fancy camera. Everything else, I, I, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't move on for me from the six. I'd be thinking twice if I was a, an existing uh, owner with a decent pair of um, earphones already, you know, aftermarket earphones. Yeah, that's true. Good point. Because I wouldn't want to be sticking in that little dongly uh, adapter thing. It's just a nuisance. Get Ed's view on this as the resident <laughs> headphone nutter. <laughs> I dare say he'd have a right rant. Uh, no, there is no <laughs> question it would be a that. rant. It would be a rant over that. It, it, you know, it, he could win 60 million on the lottery and he'd still have a rant. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be true. Although he'd be happy with all the you know classic cars he could buy. Uh, right, so um, that, that's basically a new iPhone 7 that's been launched. And like I say, if you are looking for deals or you want to see how much uh, that is, you can use the mobile phone comparison uh, tool that is on the website. You'll find it under the buy and sell in the menus. Um, right, before we finish with the iPhone 7, um, Nintendo, Mark. Yes, yeah, um, we're going to see uh, a new Nintendo game on the iPhone. First on iOS, uh, Super Mario Run, Shigeru Miyamoto came out um, at the unveiling of the did, iPhone did, 7. Did and... anybody understand his opening lines in English before he went nope. to Japanese? <laughs> Not a word of it. <laughs> no, no. They may as well have to- turned his mic off, to be honest. But still, it, it was... Pe- people love him, and if you if you wanted any greater um, example that, you know, really these events are already preaching to the converted and that they know who they're selling to, then this was the moment. Um, no one was going to give a bad reaction to him. Um, and, it, you know... To be fair, the game looks it looks good. It, it's an interesting idea in as much as um, Mario has always been a side scrolling platformer. And you I think everyone's always assumed that it would have to be in landscape mode. And so, he, you know, this Mario run game shows in portrait mode um, and you can play it one handed. So it's, it's quite a, a novel idea to everyone's always wondered how they were going to slim down the controls, how they would get that kind of intuitive control scheme in there. Um, and so if, if it works, then it looks like it will sell hugely. Yeah, it's going to be massive. And you can just see what kind of effect Pokemon Go has had as well, because um, uh, you just knew that that was going to pop up at some point with Apple and uh, it, on the watch, you know. Well, po- like. Yeah, Pokemon Go Plus coming to the iWatch. That's that's an, another big thing. Um, yeah. The yeah. only fly in the ointment here is the fact that um, the Mario runs coming first to iOS, so that should be coming to Android as well. But it means that Animal Crossing and Fire Emblem, the two games that were also slated to come in 2016, will now be pushed back to 2017. So, you know, there are slight fallouts to that, but I'm sure for the sake of a a new Mario game on everyone's iPhone, I'm sure people will accept that. Did I understand it right? Did it pick it up right that um, even if you've got it on the watch, you know, Pokemon Go and, and a new Pokemon pops up, you still have to go and get your phone out? to catch it oh i haven't seen that no uh, that's what um, I, picked. I, I as i assume as i understand it the the pokemon go plus the little uh, wristband thing works purely as a notification so it, it'll vibrate it's it's a separate thing so i'm assuming that with regards iwatch functionality they're just shifting those things onto mm. the iwatch so you don't have to buy a separate thing yeah so that's, you, that's still tethered th- to the phone yeah that's what i thought so you still need to get your phone out to catch them yes to see that they were um, some of the new tech we've been talking about all year is is sort of filtering down to phones. Well, I mean, it, it wouldn't be a, color gamuts on it wouldn't screens. be an Apple launch if they didn't click on all the biggest buzzwords in the yeah. <laughs> consumer electronics industry, wouldn't it? I mean, these are the big buzzwords, so they're going to use them. They use Nets. I've never yep. seen Apple ever use the term Nets before <laughs> ever. Uh, white color, like you say, uh, P3. You mentioned P3 at one point. Yeah. You know, these are all terminology that Apple last year weren't interested in, but because of the big buzzwords at the minute, um, you know, they latch onto them. Um, and and you know, again, I was looking at uh, the new Samsung Seven, not the one that bursts into flames, but the <laughs> when you charge it, but the other one. Um, <laughs> the the, safe one. the uh, they could market that. <laughs> it keeps you warm in winter. Well, I've I've just seen a thing from the CEA on uh, yeah. on Twitter, which is um, they're they're either going to stop people taking them onto planes, or they they need to make sure that they're all switched off and not charging when you take them onto a plane. Not good publicity for Samsung at the minute. But if you look at the seven, it's functionality wise and so on. There's not a great deal between Apple and and Samsung these days, um, apart no, from no, apart no. from the gulf in price and of course the status symbol of the Apple branding. In fact, if you talk to somebody who's really into mobile phones, they'll almost always say that, which, which shall I get, you know, in terms of functionality and capabilities, is it the Apple or the or, or the Samsung? They, they'll all say Samsung, you know, it's the superior phone in terms of functionality. But haven't and that, things they've like. lost 
one of the key selling points. It don't the, the more modern ones don't come with expandable memory now? On the, yeah, right? maybe. Because that, that was definitely one of their key selling points. Because obviously with the Apple, you're, uh, they have increased the memory, haven't they, this year with the phones 32, uh, 128 and 256. But um, finally, but uh, you could never expand. You can't expand it. And that was one of the big things about uh, using Samsung so you could expand them. You're right. I think you might be right there, Mark. Okay, so that's a, a new phone that was launched this week, just from a little company. Um, uh, we'll obviously probably have more on this going forward because I'm sure there's going to be more um, and when people get their hands on them and uh, we find out what's, uh, what they're like. So we'll be coming back to that one. Let's stay with, uh, with gaming there, Mark, and um, tell us all the positives about this new PS4 Pro that's been announced before we talk about the absolutely massive negative. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, well, yes. Um, in the event in New York, they showed off the Pro. It's it's coming out sooner rather than later, uh, November the tenth. Um, a one huge um, plus point. Uh, we were talking about the kind of pounds to dollar point and post Brexit prices. Um, it's three nine nine in the states and three four nine in this country. Uh, I I always assumed that they might just do a straightforward dollars to pounds conversion, as a lot of products seem to be doing now. Um, but no, so a decent price point. Um, they've uh, doubled the GPU. Um, they, there's a boost for the CPU. Everything seems to be tailored towards 4K. They're obviously not... Well, they will hit 4K with some some titles, but it, it probably won't be native 4K for the, the overwhelming majority. They're not fragmenting things, so you can use the same disks between the old PS4 and, and this one. And they're, they're kind of pushing HDR gaming as well and netflix and things like this so those are all massive massive positives i i'm i'm assuming that we'll get on to the big negative now go on no uhd blu-ray drive which it it, it just seemed like the most obvious decision in the world um, <laughs> and, and that's an understatement <laughs> everyone just assumed it everyone just assumed it i mean why would you not uh, particularly with the absence of their own standalone players Everyone just assumes the Xbox One S does. So yes. Even yeah. more so for me. That's the well, that will be the reason to do it, is to rival Microsoft. But I think yeah. if you listen closely, you can still hear Microsoft laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it's just it it's a strange decision. But then again, I, you have to assume that perhaps price was simply the point. It can't have bumped the price that much, but perhaps they simply they were cutting it fine. We've we've gone past the days of kind of subsidized console launches you know they want to be making breaking even or making a profit from launch their console divisions aren't allowed to be making those huge losses in in the early years of a new product being launched and so they perhaps just had to hit that 399 price point when you look at how they've kind of positioned everything about the the playstation 4 it's all been about value it, you know it's, it was an added bonus that it was more powerful than the xbox one but the fact that they lost the camera peripheral early on i think was a was a clear indication that they were very keen to hit a certain price point and to be seen as the best value option but for people with 4k sets who are looking to to dabble in gaming who want uh, a uhd blu-ray player as well it gives them a very real dilemma do you want a console that leans more heavily on perhaps gaming with more first party titles and sony and and you know better graphics for those titles but then you're stuck with only the streaming options or do you pick up an Xbox One S and given the fact that they are, you know, the, the lowest hard drive version is it's very cheap, is a good value UHD Blu-ray player and you get the benefit of being able to game on it. If you can get a hold of them. Yes, there is that. Um, but you would assume <laughs> in, in the run up to Christmas when these things are directly competing, there will be, you know. A yeah, I, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, which is price point and the fact that it's something that we keep discussing on a regular basis on the podcast, and that is uh, why will companies pay for um, hard drives and um, physical media when they can stream? And that's been the excuse that's come out of Sony is that uh, they see the future as a streaming future. Uh, and not a hardware feature. I, I think they'll be eating humble pie. I think we'll find in the next six months that that, that changes around because it'll have to change around. It could be, Steve. There is a, a little conspiracy out there. Um, I believe it was um, uh, Bill Hunt that maybe discuss, started yeah, discussing this over at the Digital bits. bits, and he was making the suggestion that perhaps they, uh, they want their standalone players to have a bit of market time before the console then gets uh, the ability to play UHD Blu-rays. 
Maybe, but I, I think that's there's maybe a bit of wishful thinking in there as well. Possibly. Um, I mean, there's no there's no question that uh, a PS4 Pro with a UHD hard drive, yeah, UHD hard drive built in that's selling for, you know, three three hundred and three hundred fifty quid, that would definitely undercut their sales. There's no question about that. If if they did that, so I can see that being a logical um, assumption. Um, but it just seems crazy to basically hand over the entire market now to uh, Microsoft in terms of anyone who wants to buy a game gaming console combined with an Ultra HD Blu-ray player, you've only got one choice. Um, having said that, obviously Sony's view has always been with the PS4 that it's for gaming primarily, and it's not meant to be an all for, you know all one, all in one solution the way that the PS3 was and the way that the Xbox One is being pitched. So yeah, okay, I mean we'll see. Um, what what they do need to do is, and, and hopefully they'll announce it at Cedia. They need to get these these standalone players into the marketplace, at least one, possibly two, apparently, uh, because it's getting slightly embarrassing now, isn't it? I mean, the company that developed Blu-ray still hasn't got an Ultra HD Blu-ray player in the marketplace. Maybe and despite what they may say, it's doing really well as a format. Maybe they so, th- maybe they think they're big like Apple and that they can be brave and and change the marketplace. Because <laughs> you got you well, got there is- you got a question: Why didn't they come out straight away with a with a standalone player? They're either caught napping. Or they they believe that streaming is the future and they want you to try and force that onto the marketplace. There is the theory that, in fact, they're trying to push their own content service. So this was similar to when the the PS4 came out and people were were asking for, you know, the ability to play CDs or the ability to plug in their own MP3 players and things like that. And the answer was, well, we've got, you know, kind of PlayStation Music or whatever it was called, I forget. Um, And we've got our own streaming service for that with X number of artists and and. I think some people suspect that perhaps they're trying to do the same thing now with a video service. So to say, you know, we'll watch it through streaming. Streaming is the future, and we just happen to have our own service as well. Yeah, well, if they do, do that, they're going to they're going to have an egg on their faces because they're already massively behind the likes of Amazon and uh, Netflix, and there's no way they're going to catch up. Not well, a chance. Well, the other thing is that the actual studio that they own, Sony <laughs> Pictures, is is one of the big companies when it comes to. Um, UHD Blu-ray discs. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, I mean, what are Sony customers going to play the Smurfs free on? I, I, no, seriously. I mean, I think of all the studios, Sony are the ones that are doing the best job right now in terms of Ultra HD Blu-ray. They are, you know, consistently where, wherever possible, it's a 4K DI, so it's a native 4K image. They're doing Dolby Atmos sound drops on every single release, even if it didn't have one originally. They're doing a new remix. They're really, really div- putting out some. I mean, some of the titles aren't great. You're absolutely right, Phil. But, you know, in terms of what they're trying to do in, in terms of supporting the format, they're doing a bang-up job. It's, it's crazy that the hardware side of the business isn't supporting them. And I honestly think that you, Mark's partly right. I think they really want to push their streaming services because it's cutting out the middle man. It's more profit for them. I also think that deep down inside, they didn't think that Blue, Ultra HD Blue was going to do very well. And I think they're, they're going to find out by the end of the year that they've made a mistake there because it actually it's – I mean, in terms of its launch success, and this is talking to the BDA – vastly much much better than blu-ray when it launched i mean granted that was in the middle of a format war but you know it's a bigger launch they said that the back at ces they're going to have 100 titles by the end of the year they're going to hit 100 titles by the end of the year so we've got 100 titles are available multiple players from different manufacturers and still nothing from sony that's just embarrassing in my opinion there was a, a one nice little bit of news though uh extra bit of news for existing ps4 owners with regards tvs and that kind of thing which is that going to be a firmware update so all ps4s will be uh hdr compatible so that that was a nice little thing yeah um, that was actually quite a surprise they also um uh, outlined new ps4 slim which will kind of take over from the current sku uh which will be out september 15th standard kind of slim everything down lower power consumption that kind of thing uh, and that will be launching at 259 pounds the only minor fly in the ointment with that similar kind of harking back to with the iphone is that there will be no optical out on that so if like me you use a, a pair of gaming headphones that uses the optical out uh, you might want to be mindful of that you're already seeing the, the kind of people saying well it, it didn't really matter about the uhd blu-ray drive um 4k films are selling terribly you know physical media is dead <laughs> that kind of thing 4k sets aren't, aren't yeah. and virtually every every metric puts it kind of ahead in terms of where things were i think people just forget how slow it we were to kind of adopt to to full hd particularly you know and and how slow it was for the content to be there you know most yeah, people totally. actually bought if you go back to the days of particularly the xbox 360 when that launched first 
people bought that when they had standard definition TVs. Yeah. People bought it and then they planned to buy an HD TV. You know, the, right. the content comes and then you upgrade the, the chain. The situation's people... reversed now. Yeah, there's a exactly. massive established 4K TV base and there's no damn content half the time. And that people are crying out for content. And that's why Ultra HD Blu-ray has actually been a phenomenal success relative to things like Blu-ray. Um, because there is an established user base already. Yeah. And and that's why I think Sony, um, in terms of the hardware side um, and not releasing a player, I, I've kind of you missed a trick there, really. I think yeah, they, it's they... Ab- absolutely baffling. But then you have to look at Sony and you have to look at the, the culture behind that company. And again, this is only my personal opinion, having dealt with the company. But it is so. It, at one time, it was so huge and they were the world's number one manufacturer. And it went to their heads completely went to their heads we are sony i remember the first time i ever went to an event covering it for av forums and i, I tried to get into the sony area and get to speak to them and they were so arrogant um but of course they you know they fell from grace pretty quickly they lost loads of money pretty quickly but the the problem is they still think they're this massive company again this is my personal opinion and they are split into so many different companies now <laughs> Um, you know the TV company's separate, the gaming side separate, the the home appliances side separate, and 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 there are all these separate areas and different people covering different things and being in charge of different things, and that's why the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. That's why, <laughs> that's why you know you you get standalone players don't come out at, at format launch because um, they probably didn't realise that they had to be there, you know, because they're too busy working on something else, or you know, somebody didn't get the memo or whatever. They're such a big company, that, and the, they're split into so many different areas that, it, it, you know, sometimes it's impossible just for us to get <laughs> the information that we need because we need to speak to three different people in three different areas and divisions of the company. It's it's, and when you structures like that, then I, I I fully understand why things happen the way they happen with Sony. Completely. I'll never forget the Bristol show where they were doing a demo. I think it was one of their projectors at the time, but they couldn't get permission from Sony Pictures to show <laughs> any Sony Pictures content on it. It's like, isn't that why you bought a studio? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, it's completely bizarre. And and again, it's the culture that's been there since they were, you know, since they were top of the pile. And it's a long time since Sony were top of the pile. But there's still that 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 attitude and that that drive that they they still think they are. Um, I think they've yeah. done a, a good job in the past decade of, of writing that with regards to the games division. That's all I'd say. Where People were kind of calling them arrogant Sony in the days of the PS3 launch, particularly with regards to their bullishness over the price. And people saw it as a kind of um, having things in it which they didn't want. You know, there were a lot of people who didn't want the Blu-ray drive. Um, so I, I think they're, they're kind of always mindful of not repeating past mistakes. And, and I think they also realise that if they continue to just go with the value proposition in, in looking like it's a reasonable price point with regards the amount of kind of first party titles they have to offer and just let people buy based on the games. You know, it's great if it's a media device as well, but not deviate so far from their core base. Yeah. OK, so uh, that's hardware news for this week. We'll be back in a sec with movie news. Okay, uh, moving on to movie news and uh, breaking news is that we are two weeks into September and I have yet to go to the cinema <laughs> on my <laughs> unlimited card. So, so already I've lasted a long time. So already we're we're in. Oh, hang on, no, you went to see War Dogs last. No, week. no, that was on the thirty thirty first uh, August. Um, end of August, I saw that, Steve. So oh, I, okay. as far as September right. goes. I've paid my seventeen ninety nine on the first of September and I ain't been yet. So is this month two and I've already fallen down? Who knows? Tune in next week to find out. Um, <laughs> right. So films opening this Friday. I'm not sure that the films opening this Friday are going to help your cause much. <laughs> well, you see, the big the big issue I've got here, Steve, right, is that this is the AV Forums podcast, okay? And uh, yes, Bridget Jones's baby is coming out this Friday, uh, but and you've got the guys to quote from the original Bridget, Bridget Jones's diary. However. This week is the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. <laughs> Why the hell would there be no quoting from a Star Trek film? This is the <laughs> AV Forums podcast. Bridget Jones, really? Because we've, A, Bridget Jones' diary, I think, is really funny. Uh, and B, we I, I think you're the only person recently. that thinks that, then. No, it's a great film, Bridget Jones' diary. The sequel is terrible, but uh, the first <laughs> film, I think, is excellent. I'm starting to agree with this guy that commented the other week saying, I'm not really sure about Steve's movie reviews. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, there isn't one this week because like you, I haven't had a chance to go to the cinema. But we do have two films opening on Friday, one of which is Blair Witch, a remake of Blair Witch Project. That is one sequel. film that did the need to be remade for this. Well, I mean, it was made in <laughs> secret, so it was no one knew it was being shot until it was announced. Um, so it was something no one had asked for and no one needed. I mean, and if you watch the Honest Trailer, um, Blair Witch... Um, the, the thing it was, it wasn't funny because everything they were saying was so damn true uh, about that production yeah. and, and that film. It was, I mean, at the time it was groundbreaking, but it was groundbreaking not because of the film and the content of the film, but the way a, it was put together for sixty thousand dollars and it brought in one hundred and twenty-eight million. Um, the other was it was the first film to ever make use of the internet in terms of yeah. marketing and and in terms of trying to make out that it was a, a real thing and that the tapes had been found and it, and these people were real and all the rest. Of it. I mean. They really used the internet to full effect, and it was the first film to ever do that. But those two reasons had nothing to do with the actual content of the film, which was absolutely dire. It was, the film wasn't well, even original, because there's a film called The Last Broadcast that was made before it, which basically got exactly the same premise. I remember yeah. watching The Blairish Project, at the end of it, I don't know about you, Phil, I sat and thinking, huh? Is that it? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Wait a minute, yeah. <laughs> I want my money back. <laughs> yeah, big disappointment. So you got that coming out on Friday. Um, so for, some, for some reason, Sharuna is quite excited about the idea of a remake of Blair Witch, and she's going to go and see it. But uh, I can't say it's on my radar or something that I'm particularly interested in. Bridget Jones's Baby, on the other hand, whilst the sequel, um, Bridget Jones, The Edge, Edge of Reason, was absolutely appalling, um, this has been getting good reviews, and it looks quite funny in the trailer. So um, I might actually go and see Bridget Jones's Baby at, at the weekend. The one you based on, on, on the books? Well, was, was, uh, yes. Was more so, than one so, book? Yes, they are based upon the three books, except, um, particularly in the case of the third book, Bridget Jones's Baby, um, the film deviates from that significantly because uh, in the book, Mark Darcy's character is dead. So um, that's the Colin Firth character, whereas in the film, he's very much alive and part of the movie. Uh, so it, so I only a minor deviation then. Major deviation. It's very different from the book, apparently. But uh, you know, it looks uh, it looks um, it looks quite funny, trailers. And uh, yeah, uh, my big concern was whether. Um, um, when his old had too much plastic surgery and wouldn't look anything like her, her old self, but uh, she seems to be okay in the trailers. So. The, the only way I'd, I'd go to see Bridget Jones's baby if I really have to make, make sure that I don't waste money on my limited card. card. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drag along Laura to make her use her bloody card because she never goes to the cinema anymore. Is that cinema news? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> that was it, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for that. So if people aren't using their limited cards. I think that's that's the main thing we can take away from this City week's <laughs> this week's movie news. All uh, right, Blu-ray releases. Uh, anything worth buying? Yeah, well, one of these actually was released last week, but I put it in running order because I think it's worth mentioning, which is obviously Captain America: Civil War. It's now available on Blu-ray. It came out. It comes out. Uh, it came out on the in the UK on the fifth of September. So actually two weeks before the US release, which is unusual. Um, absolutely cracking film. Saw it at the cinema. Really, really enjoyed it. It's one of the few. Um, superhero movies which manages to juggle a large cast without resorting to a big you know uh, alien invasion city destroying conclusion a la most of the uh, warner stuff of late this one actually has a very uh, intimate storyline uh, and because it's essentially about the battle between iron man and captain america it keeps it small small scale but managed to juggle a large cast of characters, introducing new characters into the Marvel Universe as well. One particular noteworthy introduction, which um, I won't spoil for the few people that don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, fantastic film. Great was, was it not in the really trailer? Sorry? Was his revelation not in the trailer? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's not really <laughs> a spoiler. If, it's, if, it's in the, the if it's in the trailer, it's not, in my opinion, it is not a spoiler if it's in the trailer. No, it's not. Spider-Man was, I mean, obviously also it was big news because um, after the um, poor performance of, Sp of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Sony went basically very sensibly, went back to Marvel and said, look, you know, how why don't we do something together? And um, so Spider-Man is in Civil War and uh, Marvel are making a new standalone Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man Homecoming, for Sony. So um, good news all around, really, I think, as far as the Marvel Universe goes. Um, and it's a, it's a really good film. and I highly recommend it. It's also a very good disc. Uh, really great picture and sound. Sadly, uh, you know, it's Disney, so there's no Atmos, but um, or any Ultra HD version. But uh, but yeah, it's 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 worth picking up um, if you haven't seen it yet. It's a great movie. The other thing coming out, there's basically a whole load of DC TV stuff being released. Um, so you've got the Flash season two coming out. We've also got Arrow season four and Legends of Tomorrow season one. All these new DV, DC TV series. And from what I'm, I must admit, I've not really watched much of the dc tv stuff apart from a bit of gotham but I, and i understand that they're 
the TV stuff is significantly better than the movies that they've been producing. Um, they've been doing some really good stuff on the on the t- on the TV side of things, uh, and actually um, um, some of these shows are very popular and very well received. Particularly The Flash and also Arrow has been getting good re- good reviews. Not so good on Legends of Tomorrow, it has to be said, but uh, the first two have been well received. And Kaz is currently ploughing his way through <laughs> all those box sets. Yeah, I can think of no better person to do that, actually. Mm-hmm. Ultra HD Blu-ray, Steve. Uh, yes, a couple of, um, well, one big announcement since the last time we discussed Ultra HD Blu-ray, which is that Lionsgate are bringing out the four Hunger Games movies on Ultra HD Blu-ray. Pass. That's, sorry. Pass. <laughs> the Hunger Games, Catching Fire, Mockingjay Part 1 and Mockingjay Part 2, all with Dolby Atmos soundtracks. Um, and they're coming out in November. Uh, otherwise, it's much the same as before. Um, we've got quite a bit coming out in September. Uh, and then a lot coming out in October. So, like I said uh, earlier in this podcast, you know, they announced at uh, CES. I think they were being quite bullish at the time. That we're going to have a hundred discs out by the end of the year, but it looks like they're actually going to hit that target. And that's without and, and that's without Disney, you know, helping out because they haven't done any launches yet. So, um, but the other studios certainly are upping their game. Uh, and ironically, one of the studios doing the most for um, is actually Sony. So there you go. Uh, Hodge, how's your UHD collection coming along? It's not really expanded any since last time we spoke, I'm afraid. So, so, so what's that king? I've, I've already got a backlog. I've got I've got seven discs and I haven't watched four of them. <laughs> so yeah, I'm starting. Well, haven't you watched it? Uh, I, you know, that's a bloody good question. Uh, San Andreas, although I've probably no intention of really watching that anyway. Uh, well, no, it's good. You should watch it. I enjoyed it. Should I? I don't know. I, I honestly couldn't tell you. I can't remember. <laughs> Your enthusiasm is amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I, I think I'm back to my old penny pension way, Steve, because uh, I, was, I was in HMB um, end of August there and uh, looking at the the UHD discs and looking at them and thinking 24.99 or 19.99, mm, bit steep. I'm a bit like that. I am enthusiastic about it, but I am a bit like that with pricing. Just I'll only watch things once. I'm, only, I'm a watch once kind of that, guy. That, that's the thing for me. I, I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, well, actually, I'm only going to buy stuff like Independence Day, which I will watch more than once, or I'll be using it as a demo disc, or there's scenes in there that I've known all the way back to the laser disc. You know what I mean? So I know I'm going to get my money's worth out of it. I'm going to use it, going to use it, or going to watch it more than once. And that's the thing. I, I was looking at um, Superman, Batman, and I'm thinking, yeah, it'll be good to see in UHD Blu-ray, but um, do I really want to be paying £25 just to probably watch it the once? I think it's well established on this podcast that I have a slightly different approach. <laughs> <We've noticed. laughs> oh, Lego yeah. movies. Well, not, not yeah, yet. Steve, oh. it, it, and we've all got our different priorities and that kind of thing, and we all like to spend our disposable on different things. So I think addiction is the word you're looking for. <laughs> I was just trying to be polite, Steve. <laughs> no, no, don't bother. Don't for mean, once. Say it like it is. It's an addiction. <laughs> well, there are still some Blu-ray box sets that are ridiculous prices, to be honest. Yeah. I, I bought the Lethal Weapon the four disc box set, five disc box set for uh, I think it was eleven ninety nine last week. <laughs> well, Criterion are just uh, re-releasing the Zatoichi box set. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, without all the the DVDs, and that is seriously tempting because you know that it will just end up going up in price. But it it's it just it looks just kind of prohibitively priced, but it, it does look great. I noticed the uh, so, Cap- Captain uh, America three film box set and I thought well I haven't seen any of them so that would be a good buy for me but it's £27 at the minute just come out this week uh, give that a month or two that'll be down to 15 quid. I'll pick it up then probably true and since you haven't seen the other two and it's been a few years you don't need to rush do you really exactly plus yeah. you might need to actually get Avengers and Avengers um, Age of Ultron because they're kind of I, all three I've, um, I've got them already oh well there you go then you can do your five I just haven't watched them yet <laughs> <laughs> Did you, Mark, uh, Mark Bot, uh, Bot right? did you see that um, I think Criterion also doing uh, Alone Wolf and Cub re, um, new disc? No, I, I I haven't seen that. That's ah, oh. right, right, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I'm doing once we right, end this podcast, come on. Shake an assassin. <laughs> <laughs> I thought owning Mentioned in every format. Time. Well, yeah. it's something to look forward to as we move on swiftly because we're running out of time. But um, interestingly, we were talking about uh, Sony and, and maybe they, they don't, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. Um, a little story that amused me that popped up on the BBC Technology website um, during the week. And that was that Warners um, have reported their own website for breach of copyright. Yeah, um, so they, they obviously um, hand this job out to a third party who goes around looking for the internet, looking for links that 
link to uh, illegal versions of their films or, or uh, copyrighted material or images or all the rest of it. <laughs> third party reported themselves to Warner's. Um, it would be even better if Google had taken them off. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than put yeah, that to the visual yeah. site. <laughs> at, least, at least somebody at Google knows what, what the crack is and knows what's not copyrighted. <laughs> so. I mean, could, could you imagine the damage that would do if they had removed all those links? Yeah. <laughs> So it just shows you how, you know, cock hoop sometimes this uh, fight on piracy is and how stupid it is sometimes because then, you know, they end up reporting themselves to themselves um, over copyrighted material and so on. Uh, I'm sure there's better ways to be spending your money, Warners. And uh, Jason Bourne um, has been making the Chinese sick, apparently. Yeah, because um, unlike the rest of the world, uh, 3D is still hugely popular in China. So quite often studios do 3D conversions of films only for the Chinese market. Um and they, and, but I don't think they necessarily thought this one through because they 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 did a 3D conversion of Jason Bourne, and it was almost entirely you could only really see it in 3D. There was hardly any 2D screenings in China. And anyone who's ever seen a Jason Bourne movie knows that ain't the kind of film you want to turn into a 3D film because you know 3D, even if you're doing a conversion, you still shoot it with that thought in mind. So you know obviously you want to keep the camera relatively static for a lot of shots and that kind of stuff. Now all that shaky cam stuff that was in Jason Bourne. People were basically throwing up in the cinema because of yeah. motion sickness and things like that. And um, I'm not surprised. So it just goes to show that just because 3D is popular in certain territories, not all films are appropriate <laughs> for 3D conversion. And this definitely was one of them. <laughs> uh, it, it just reminds me of Family Guy and, and you know, thinking about a Chinese audience like that, because once one person goes, then everybody follows <laughs> And that, that's Family Guy with it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a joke they usually string out for about three minutes, don't they, as well? <laughs> just keep ramming the yeah, point home. <laughs> but just to transfer that onto 200 people in a cinema, and one, one, once one person goes the off, oh, in the smell. <laughs> okay. I wonder if they might be a bit more cautious if they do release Blair Witch there as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, at least I know how to entertain myself. Right, so I mentioned earlier on, um, it's a big birthday for Star Trek. 50 years, can you... It's hard to believe that. Um, it's older really, than it's, Yeah, almost older. just older than me, yeah. Just, just, just older. <laughs> That's quite um, a But it's in- interesting, I, I noticed Sci-Fi Channel um, have been running on on a loop, the, uh, the uh, original cast movies, um, almost every night this week, but they're also running uh, Voyager and um, Deep Space Nine and the next generation. Am I missing any of that? Enterprise. Enterprise. But I couldn't forget Enterprise. Can we? It never really happened, did it? I liked Enterprise. It's a long way. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> all, all those series are available to watch on Netflix as well. Yes, they are. Catching and, um, uh, yeah, it, again, I'd, it just comes down to time, Steve. You know, this this is the annoying thing with services like Netflix and, and Amazon and so on. You see so many things that you want to watch. And you think, oh, yeah, I'm going to watch that. I'll have to watch that later. And I'll, I'll watch that later. And, the, oh, there's all the Star Treks. I'll have to watch them. Now we get around to it. No, not the tech. I've got to say, um, I, I did watch Space Seed, which is the episode of Star Trek, the original series, with um, which introduces the character of Khan. I watched that, and then afterwards I watched Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, the director's cut Blu-ray release that came out a few weeks ago. And um, I think uh, Paramount done a fantastic job of cleaning up, you know, because um, obviously they were shot on 35mm, um, these the original series, and they've cleaned up the effects and, and new, new effects. It's the same effect shot, but just done with, you know, CGI rather than the old model shots. And it uh, looked really, really good. Very impressive. So, yeah. Uh, I might watch double, double in some more of the old things because there are some great episodes of that original series. Things like City on the Edge of Forever was a cl- cracky one with Joan Collins. Um, there's some great, great episodes to watch, so I might um, might uh, plough through a few more of those yeah. uh, classic I, I, episodes. I, from the, a lot of the originals yeah. are, are entertaining to watch, um, uh, and yeah, I enjoy dipping into it. I don't think I've actually sat and watched um, the original series from beginning to end. I think there's still a few episodes I haven't seen yet. No. Um, from the original series, it's not one that I've sat. The only one that I, I really have followed from beginning to end, encountered at far point, right the way through to all good things, and that's the next generation. Um, and for some reason, I did follow that whole series all the way through when it was broadcast. Um, Voyager, I started with Voyager and then lost interest halfway through. Yeah, me too. And, and that was more of I had other things um, to do rather than sit and watching that. And it was it was before Sky Plus and that kind of thing. So. Um, I just kind of lost contact with it halfway through. Um, I never got into Deep Space Nine. 
it was it, that was the one series that passed me by was Deep Space Nine. Never got into it. Although apparently um, it's one of the better series, from what I understand, people that are into Star Trek and watched all the series. I have only watched one episode, which was Trials and Tribulations, the one where they go back in time and into the old <laughs> original series, which was quite a clever one. Um, now, people always recommend it as having, shall we say, deeper plots and kind of mm, interconnected yes. characters and stuff like that. So I keep meaning to get into it. But I always and, felt to me, because it was set on a space station, it was just too similar to Babylon 5, and, and um, I preferred that when I was back in the day. Yeah, but so. uh, yeah, at, at least with the other series, they're, they're travelling. <laughs> so they're going to new places and new sets. And When you're stuck in one location, it kind of it, it's difficult for you to take it very far, isn't it, really, in terms of storylines? and it, you're, you're more about people coming to you than you going to people. Yeah. I'll tell you what's interesting is that you know 50 years old um and 50 years ago when star trek first aired you know it was quite a by being a science fiction series Roddenberry could put things in that perhaps would have been controversial at the time in an actual drama but it wasn't a huge success i mean it did three seasons and then it got cancelled it's hard to think now 50 years later you know we've had an animated series the next generation deep space nine voyager enterprise there's a new season starting in in january um we've had six original cast films we've had four next generation films and we're on to our third of the rebooted films yeah uh from a tv series that got cancelled in 1970 <laughs> yeah no it's it, and it's really interesting if you uh, there's, there's a few documentaries i think they're still on netflix a few documentaries which go from original series and follow the fans and and, and follow gene roddenberry's story i think it's actually uh, made by his, his son Mm, yeah. Um, and it's really, really interesting documentary about him and uh, his career and how he came about it and how he pushed it to CBS and how he he almost petitioned them when he knew it was going to get cancelled and he he had a protest outside the studio gates and all the rest of it and and what happened in those years where it was off the air and went into syndication and that kind of thing. It's a really, really, really interesting story as to how it gained popularity and how. It, it started to spawn this this whole community behind it yeah. way well before the days of the internet and yeah. online communities and that kind of thing and how uh, the convention scene started up and then you know Star Wars was a big success and that's what led on to them then making uh, the motion picture which led on to the series uh, original um, uh, uh, Star movies and so on and I've got to say I, I still go back to the original movies rather than the next generation movies. The only next generation movie I go back to is First Contact. Yeah, First Contact is a good one. Um, I, I don't like I, they're all right, but they're, they're not classics in any way. The other next generation films, I don't think First Contact is really good. Um, mm. But I will go back to the originals, even the bad originals. <laughs> and I, I've got to well, say, even my, Star Trek Five. Even Star Trek Five is is better than some of the generations films for me. But my favourites have to be uh, Rutha Khan, and I've got a real um, soft spot for number four, The Voyage Home. Yeah. I enjoy that. Two, two four, and six, uh, um, as, as is the unwritten rule of Star Trek films, uh, tend to be the good ones, the even numbers. So two, four, and six, and then uh, I guess I, you I, I actually, first contact is... I actually eight. enjoy the original. I, I enjoy the uh, original motion picture. Really? Yeah, I, I think I, it's I do. just mindlessly boring and nothing really happens it, for it, two and a half hours. It is a bit... It is a bit like like that, and it's a you know it could it's do it be cut. Yeah, form. it is it is. But then again, it's Star Trek, and it's it was the first time the original cast had been on screen, and there's yes, there's some bits of it that are really good. And and the whole Voyager thing, I find that really quite interesting. I thought that was quite a nice twist, even though it took yeah. us four and a half hours to get to that point. <laughs> with four, four and a half hours of nice shots of the Enterprise with the music playing, and and yeah. and and now and again. Uh, it cuts back to Kirk and, and Scotty flying towards it, and then it cuts back to more scenes, <laughs> more angles of the Enterprise. I mean, that whole that must be about 30 minutes of the film. That I actually like that sequence because it's like, it's like an, you know, it's a love letter to the Enterprise, isn't it? And, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it just, does look stunning. It, it just, on a big screen. You can see why Family Guy and the rest of them really pick on that that scene <laughs> and play it out and play it out and play it out long after it's been funny i and find it, it hard going. to watch calm without giggling at certain scenes because the family i mean there's the whole bit when he goes <laughs> also the fantastic bit at the end when he goes of all the souls i've ever encountered in my travels his was the most human <laughs> <laughs> well that's when brian oh sorry let's not give spoilers away so oh actually if, if you're into star trek there is also um to tie in with this 50th anniversary there are two new books that have been published called the first 25 years and the next 25 years um which is a, an oral history of the uh, warts and all totally unauthorized but basically based on interviews of all the people that were involved in Star Trek, um, gives you the full story, the full behind the scenes, 
you know, completely um, unexpurgated version of what happened from the intercept, you know, from Chip Rodden, Roddenberry creating Star Trek right through until the most recent stuff. And, and there's some very good stuff in those sort of years you were talking about, Phil, between 70 and 79, when they were trying to bring it back and the ideas they had, and they were going to do that phase two TV series that morphed into becoming the motion picture because of Star Wars. Um, yeah, which I'm actually thinking on my order because apparently they are really good reads if you're a fan of Star Trek. I thought we'd be bigger Star Trek fans than we actually are. Uh, no, I've always been a Star Wars fan. Star Trek's just a, you know, a sideline. <laughs> there's too Trek much of it. To be honest, with Star Trek, and it's, and it's becoming that way with Star Wars now, thanks yeah. to Disney. There's just too much Star Trek to read. Yeah, you can't, the, you can't yeah. watch all that stuff. I've got time. And unfortunately, Star Trek, Star Wars rather, is now going in the same direction. You know, it's multiple. funny. It's funny you say that because you know, listening to my nephew talking about, but and he's talking about characters, and I've not got a freaking clue who he's talking about. He's talking about Star Wars. And Star Wars characters, obviously from Rebels and that kind of thing. And I haven't got a clue who he's talking about. And you it's know, like, it's funny, because uh, when we were kids, we would have known all that stuff too. Names of all the characters, even though their names are never mentioned in the film. Yeah. I mean, like, um, Sam people are called Sam people, but they're never referred to as um, Tusken Raiders, but we knew that was what they were called. Mm. I don't think at any point anyone says the planet's name is Tatooine, but we obviously knew that was the name of the planet. I mean, there's there's loads and loads of things that you just kind of knew because you'd been reading about it for so long around the subject. And I guess that's what kids do now as well. And they're still, they know all the names of all the characters. And then I'm thinking like, who? Yeah. I actually I d- would struggle to name all the characters in Rebels. And I actually watched it and enjoyed it. But so I don't remember the names. It's because you're not buying the toys as well. That's the thing. Because yeah. you used to go and buy the toys and, and buy the figures. And you would see a figure in, 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 the, in the store. I've been and... used to. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you would pick up the figure and it would have the name of the figure there. and But the name was never in any of the films. So it wasn't until you went, actually went and picked up the uh, the box and read what the names were. That's that's how you learned who everybody was in the original uh, Star Wars. Well, certainly that's how, how it worked for me when I was a kid. Uh, but like you say, I mean, it was it was always in the magazines that you'd buy as a kid and stuff. I mean, there was Lucan magazine. I'm trying to think what other magazines there were when I was a kid. Starburst was the one um, I was reading back in yeah, 77. Yeah, there was that. And there's there other things that... Because we didn't have the internet back then either. So That's also because yeah. it came out in, in May 77, but it didn't really hit the UK until Boxing Day and into January, March, um, January 8th, February of 78. I had a good six to eight months of build up for this you know reading about it constantly and just can't wait to see this film it was i mean it's i think it's probably difficult to explain to the modern generation or you know people that weren't around at the time what that was like but you know when i was 10 that was it was you know, it, I, I, nothing since then has come close to that experience either i really did peak yeah. at that point and that was it you know it's been downhill ever since really yeah yeah <laughs> but i mean it, it, like you say getting it back to the original um conversation which is star trek and not star wars um <laughs> i think we've just proved our point <laughs> yeah, allegiance is there. um but yeah d- it, you know the, there is a lot more to that universe um yes star wars is catching up uh, uh fair rate or not but it is a really expanded universe of star trek one there's, there's lots of things there for different people to to like and i guess that's why the conventions uh, are so huge uh why so many people um get involved with it and and of course there's there's the social messages as well which you know nowadays they stick out like a sore thumb especially the original series steve but back in the day it it was quite brave of roddenberry to to try and you know force the issue as it were through through the drama and of course there was that first first ever case on tv yeah with with a racial case so um it really was at the same time pushing boundaries with that and it's something that star trek's always been about there's always been a moral issue behind the stories yeah, there's, and there's always a sense of, there's a moral issue to a lot of the stories and a sense of hope about the future, which I think is a very 60s um, mentality. I don't think, you know, you wouldn't have had that series created in the 1970s when there was a very much a movies and TV were moving towards dystopia. And there was a kind of sense of, uh, you know, depression because of things like Watergate and the Vietnam War. Um, whereas in the 60s with things like Apollo, there was this sense of greater hope of the, for the future. And that's definitely reflected in Star Trek, where you have this kind of um, essentially uh, inter, inter, interstellar UN, isn't it, with um, all different species working together in harmony uh, and, you know, multi, multi-ethnic, multi uh, multiracial crews on the ships and, and women in scene. Although, interestingly, the original pilot had number one as a female. Uh, Marjorie Barrett, Barrett played the part of number one 
Um, and he, Brett Roddenberry was told by the studios, that's ridiculous, you'll never have a woman in that role. And, and he had to drop that character and, and she became a nurse in a more traditional female role in, in the actual series. And they, they said, you can either keep the woman number one or you can keep the alien. He said, well, okay, well, I'll keep the alien. Um, so they could, they could actually believe an alien in the role of a, senior, a, you know, a second, a number one uh, commanding officer rather than the female in a commanding officer role, um, which is kind of very telling of the times. But Roddenberry certainly tried to push the boundaries in terms of sexuality and um, and race and that kind of thing, and and which you know, um, I think you could always do that more. Like I said earlier, in the realms of science fiction, uh, where where most science fiction stories really are more moral tales or st stories about our world, but just made to look slightly different in order to get across something that might be considered controversial at the time. Um, and you know, it's always interesting to watch sci-fi films because they always say more about the time that they were made in than they do about whatever they were meant to be covering you know, some future period. It's always really about when they were made. So something from the 70s will be dark and dystopian and slightly depressing, whereas something from the 60s tends to be much more optimistic. Yeah. And, of course, just look at the technology. Um, and, and I think we're, we're actually ahead of schedule in terms of catching up with Star Trek technology, especially computing power. Um, and even, communicators. And, well, I was just going to come on to that. Even looking at the next generation, um, you know, some of the technology has moved on even since that was first broadcast. I mean, and just look at what Apple's announced this week um, mm. as a good example, you know, in terms of where we've come in terms of communications and, and computing power. I mean, look at an iPhone and how much computing power you have in that iPhone. It's about nine or ten times the power of the Apollo mission. Of Apollo spacecraft, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's just in the core processing. That's not yeah. in any of the graphic the stuff or anything else. had a 3.5 mil input, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, mil mil the Millennium Falcon did. You know, hand on his little, yeah, let's blow this thing, get, yeah. let's go home. Imagine if he'd been fumbling around for proprietary earplugs. Exactly, or waiting for his wireless signal to work. <laughs> I mean, I've only got two minutes charge left. <laughs> the one thing I wish they'd invented from Star Trek that I would, I would love is tele, you know, being able to teleport. Because, you know, how many times have you sat in an airport thinking, I've got 10 hours to like get home <laughs> and thinking, if I could just teleport there in a second. Yeah, but it's, it, <laughs> it's, the, it's the one bit of completing out of fantasy, though, that from the whole thing that will never, ever, ever yeah. come true. Because I think I watched them, something on Discovery, and they were, they were going on about the science of Star Trek and all the rest of it. And teleportation will never happen. Just the computing power alone to take every single atom of the human body and then de de <laughs> deconstruct it and then reconstruct it, but not also that, but move it through space and time, and it's just impossible. It'll never happen. It's it's, it's pure fantasy, but it'd be great, Steve. It really would, because I think they made the point of that in, um, in Star Trek Beyond. There's a shot of, it's almost like the suicide booths in Futurama, <laughs> where there's the queue of people and they're just going in the booth and disappearing and they're being teleported somewhere else. <laughs> And the first thing I thought about when I saw that was that Futurama thing. <laughs> well, don't they have the reason that they have that long effect shot of uh, Kirk and Scotty flying up the Enterprise in such motion pictures because the teleporter doesn't work, does it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Trans that transporter, not home. teleporter. Transporter. Let's, let's be correct. Of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's actually a scene in the motion picture where um, it goes wrong, and yeah. there's two people, and it, all that's left is this steaming pile of inside out humans. Which is why Bones has that fear of he'll never get in the transporter. Well, I think in the case of the film, couldn't it, couldn't had that happened just a few minutes before they transport Bones? So I think his point of view was very valid. <laughs> if they just killed their original science officer. <laughs> well, I'm just looking at a book right now that says teleportation may be possible. So, you know, it's it's I think inanimate objects possibly you could teleport. I, I don't, haven't I don't, they teleported know. like photons and that sort of stuff already? No, there's but apples. <laughs> But, but st will you stop mentioning apples? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it'll ever happen, Mark. And on that bombshell, uh, it's time to end this week's podcast. Uh, my thanks to Mark Butright. Why don't we see if Mark fancies a gherkin? Mark Hodgkinson. Frankly, I'd rather have a job wiping Saddam Hussein's arse. <laughs> Would that be a promotion or a demotion? <laughs> it's, just, it's, a, it's a close call. <laughs> and Steve Withers. I got to leave my job because I shagged my boss. And on that mental image... <laughs> uh, in, <laughs> I, I can categorically state you never laid a finger on me. <laughs> Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmark AV forums for latest reviews, news and video, and of course, leave us those five-star ratings on iTunes. We'll read your name out. We're not going to tell you when. We'll just do it. It'll be a surprise for you. So get your feedback in and leave us something witty. I'm Phil Hinton. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>